Well, welcome to the 700 Club. President-elect Donald Trump has nominated former Arkansas Governor Mike Huckabee as ambassador to Israel. His choice is receiving praise both from Israelis and the Christian community. Well, meanwhile, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu is once again appealing directly to the people of Iran to challenge their leaders. Chris Mitchell reports on the latest developments. Mike Huckabee is a former pastor who served as governor of Arkansas and ran for president. In a statement, Trump stated the reasons for his nomination. He loves Israel and the people of Israel. And likewise, the people of Israel love him. Mike will work tirelessly to bring about peace in the Middle East. In a recent interview, Huckabee told CBN News' Wendy Griffith the importance of standing with Israel. And in Genesis 12, it says, if you bless Israel, you'll be blessed. If you curse Israel, you'll be cursed. That's pretty clear. He also brings a solid faith to the position. But I know where I stand. And the reason I do is because I stand on the Word of God. And I stand on the principles that God is real and that His Word, His direction is more important than anything else in my life. Former U.S. Ambassador to Israel David Friedman wrote, Congrats, Mike, on getting the best job in the world. Evangelical leader Joel Rosenberg wrote, Huckabee's appointment sends a powerful message about Trump's intention to stand solidly and unwaveringly with Israel. Yigal Karman, founder of the Middle East Media Research Institute, told CBN News Huckabee is a perfect choice. Governor Huckabee is uh, an expert on Israel and the uh, region in general, uh, but he is also, and maybe more importantly, a believer, a leader in faith. Carmon says Huckabee's faith helps him understand the wave of violent attacks in the Middle East led by Shiite Iran. And it takes A, an expert, and B, a leader in faith to first understand the scope of the attack and the conflict in the region. As Israel's war with Iran's proxies continues, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu once again directly addressed the people of Iran. He hinted if Iran strikes Israel again, the IDF might retaliate by hitting Iran's most valuable resources, like its oil fields and facilities. Another attack on Israel would simply cripple Iran's economy. It would rob you of many more billions of dollars. Netanyahu suggested Iran could finally have peace if it gets rid of the Islamic regime. There is one force putting your family in grave danger, the tyrants of Tehran. That's it. Well, Chris Mitchell joins us now for more from Jerusalem. So, Chris, tell us uh, about this direct address to the Iranian people. Is, is Israel planning to uh, attack their economic infrastructure? Well, I think he's speaking directly, obviously, to the uh, the Iranian people, uh, Gordon. And I think he's saying to them, listen, we can take out your oil facilities, but we don't want to. We want your prosperity. We want your freedom. You know, it's his second address to Iranians. And I think, it, oh, Gordon, it's very significant. His first video was literally seen by millions. And the second video seems to be part of an overall strategy to mobilize and speak directly to the Iranian people. Uh, and he also said, in that address to the Iranians. Imagine what it would be like to be free, what it'd be like to speak out, even tell a joke without fear of going to prison. And also, imagine about the future of their children. What would life be like if the treasure that the regime is spending on missiles would be spent on hospitals, roads, education? So I think this message directly to the Iranian people, Gordon, is very deliberate. It seems to be a strategy, and perhaps preparing the Iranian people for the fall of the regime. Uh, as he said, the biggest threat to the regime is, isn't Israel, it's the people of Iran themselves. Isn't there potential for this to backfire? I mean, one of the things that totalitarian governments love is, is a, a, an external enemy. And so when that enemy starts directly addressing the people of Iran, is, is there any danger here this could backfire? 
Well, I, I mean, that's, that is possible, and that ha has happened in the past. Uh, but I'm not so sure, sure in this case, uh, Gordon. I think that train has left the station, I think, in terms of the Iranian people and their attitudes towards Iran. I think uh, well over 90 percent, according to the people we talk to, detest the regime. They don't like the regime. Many of the mosques in Iran are empty, and they, uh, they've had this theocracy for uh, since 1979. And so I don't necessarily think the these messages by Netanyahu will backfire in this case, because uh, they, they are on the same page in many ways. And also, I've seen, Gordon, some of the writing, literally writing on the wall, where it says, uh, you know, uh, it's something to the effect that if the U.S. and Israel do their part, we'll do our part as well. So uh, certainly, on the other hand, the Iranian regime is cracking down. It has cracked down in times past. It will again, and it has in the past few years, especially with the Iranian women who have been protesting against the hijabs. But uh, this time, I think uh, Netanyahu may be striking the right chord in his address directly to the Iranian people. Oh, I hope so. It would be it would be wonderful for the for the entire region. It would be wonderful for Israel. It would be wonderful that for the entire world for this terror sponsor to be taken taken out. That would be incredible. But at the same time, I, I pray for the people of Iran. The, the, they've shown no reluctance in turning their own army against the civilian population. Uh, would they do that again? And, and so let's pray for the army to, to wake up and realize yeah. uh, that this isn't, this isn't good for anyone. Well, let's turn to Mike Huckabee, our, our dear friend. Uh, he certainly understands Israel. He understands all the threats that Israel faces. Uh, how is he being received in Israel? Well, very favorable. Uh, you know, I think for this coalition government, he's going to be a great choice uh, for them, Huckabee and uh, Benjamin Netanyahu. Uh, they know each other very well. It's going to be a friendly face and, I'm sure, a reliable ally in terms of this uh, government. He's been here dozens and dozens of times. And I think uh, they'll share similar views on the Middle East with uh, Benjamin Netanyahu and his government. Certainly, I think they'll be on the same page about the threat of a nuclear round and as well on rebuilding on the Abraham Accords. As we heard Yagal Kharman in our interview, he really does understand the religious and the spiritual dynamic of Iran's influence. And I think he'll be favoring confrontation against the Islamic regime uh, as opposed to appeasement. Well, I, I, I applaud his diplomacy. He already is, is hitting the right note. He's saying, I, I'm not here to implement any of my policies. I'm here to implement the policies of the, of the United States and, and President Trump. Um, so what does this signal? What's, what's Trump's intent now? Uh, he had the deal of the century. Uh, there's the Abraham Accords. There was an attempt uh, by Netanyahu to let's annex Judea and Samaria. Where, where do you think Trump stands on all of that? Well, it's a great question, uh, Gordon, because he has to balance two things. First of all, the attempt by some and the, and the motivation by many here in Israel to annex and declare sovereignty over the West Bank, the biblical lands of Judea and Samaria. On the other hand, the other political and geopolitical consideration is what to do about normalization with Saudi Arabia. And, and uh, that would be the big advance in the Abraham Accords. Uh, it remains to be seen. I've been talking to some people about that today. And and uh, that's, that's a balancing act. And as you said, uh, pr prospective uh, Ambassador uh, Huckabee is striking the right chord. He's saying, I don't make policy, I Im implement policy. But that is going to be the big question. There's a, there's a push already to uh, uh, declare sovereignty over the biblical lands of Judea and Samaria. And also, other people want to make sure we, they uh, normalize relations with Saudi Arabia, expand the Abraham Accords. Uh, David Friedman, as we mentioned in that uh, 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 report, he's certainly one, and you've talked to him about one Jewish state. Part of that is uh, have a conversation here in Israel. Let's see why we should uh, declare sovereignty over Judea and Samaria, which could be a win-win as opposed to the Oslo Accords that have been going on for more than three decades and hasn't succeeded. Well, I think one of the biggest wins is we'll finally get rid of UNRWA. Uh, that seems to be a clear policy from the pr previous time Trump was president. I assume on day one he'll implement that again. Uh, and, and that that would be a welcome thing. But I think for the first time since Camp David, uh, I'm actually having hope that uh, 
there could be peace in the Middle East. So it, uh, it's a new day, and, and it's, it's one I, I really applaud and, and welcome. So, Chris, thanks for the insight. Thanks so much for joining with us. Thank you. Well, here Thanks, at home, President-elect Donald Trump heads to Washington, D.C. today. He'll meet with President Biden in the Oval Office and House GOP leaders on Capitol Hill. Trump has hit the ground running after his victory, sw swiftly making a series of key cabinet nominations. CBN's George Thomas reports. President Biden welcomes President-elect Trump back to the White House this morning as part of the orderly transition of power. The Oval Office visit will be the first face-to-face -face meeting since their debate in June. The American people deserve this. They deserve a peaceful transfer of power. They deserve a smooth trans transition. And that's what you're going to see. All this happening as Trump continues to form his administration. Overnight, he stunned Washington by nominating Fox News host Pete Hexeth to serve as Secretary of Defense. Hexeth, a veteran of Iraq and Afghanistan wars and a graduate of Princeton and Harvard, has been vocal about reforming U.S. military leadership. However, his critics argue that he lacks the experience necessary to lead such a powerful agency. You know, you got to fire the chairman of the Joint Chiefs and you got to fire this. I mean, obviously, you're going to bring in a new secretary of defense, but any general that was involved, general, admiral, whatever that was involved in any of the DEI woke, it's got to go. Trump also announced that he's nominating former director of national intelligence John Ratcliffe to head the Central Intelligence Agency. He will be a fearless fighter for the constitutional rights of all Americans while ensuring the highest levels of national security and peace through strength, the president said in a statement. Trump also plans to establish a new department focused on slashing government waste. Elon Musk and Vivek Ramaswamy will run this yet-to-be-formed department aiming to streamline the federal government and reduce bureaucracy. Just before meeting Biden, Trump will head to Capitol Hill to meet with congressional Republicans. House Speaker Mike Johnson said his party stands ready to advance Trump's second-term agenda. On Tuesday, voters rejected what they really felt was the misery of the last four years. We're moving on and we're turning the page. And this is something that the American people uh, desperately need and deserve. We are going to raise an America First banner above this place. On the Senate side, with Republicans in control of the upper chamber, a leadership vote is scheduled for Wednesday. The key contenders for Senate Republican leader include Senators John Thune, John Cornyn, and Rick Scott. George Thomas, CBN News. Well, I'm all for the optimism. At the same time, I, I look back to 2016, uh, that first two-year period where uh, the Republicans controlled Congress, Senate, uh, the White House. Uh, they got mired into a lot of hearings, and, and I hope that doesn't happen. Uh, I hope that they actually have a clear path to uh, let's, let's, let's actually govern the country. Let's not get involved in internal strife and internal... Uh, differences on policy. Let's try to have a united policy going forward. I think it will be essential, and, and I hope the Democrats don't just arbitrarily start throwing roadblocks in front of Trump, as they did in 2016, 17. These hearings that that uh, literally made no sense, and and then once they got control of Congress, they turned it into this full-blown impeachment trial. Let, let's let's have some peace in, in in the White House and in Congress, and let's have uh, governance. We need to lead the free world. We don't need to be fighting among ourselves. So my prayer: Can we come together as a nation, and can we say we have some very serious problems? Uh, whether it's the rise of China trying to influence all of uh, Southeast Asia, all of the Pacific, whether it's the aggression coming out of Russia. Uh, the horrible terrorism that Israel faces every single day, uh, the Iranian regime, all of these things require attention, and we shouldn't divert our attention right now into these internal squabbles. Let's have some peace in our capital.